Where's well, it going, guys? Back out here. Uh, not for long tonight. Um, it's already eight o'clock, so it's just, I'm just starting myself off for tomorrow. Um, I had the garage door open. I looked at this corner, and it just caught me in the corner of the eye. I saw a deep sanding scratch in this tiny little bit that I have right here. If you guys remember, that's got to be as thin as paper. The scratch probably touches the bottom. So, um, the pros and cons of high build. Now, there's no high build on there yet. Uh, that was just sealed over. Um, the pros and cons of high build. Okay, if I fill it with high build and block it, sand it, the scratch will definitely be gone. But the problem is, is if I coat this with high build and I don't let this sit a while, I mean a long while, and I sand it, that scratch will be gone, that scratch will come back, without a doubt. It does take a long time. I think the way it actually works is it, it sets and then lays in like limbo. I can't say how long because I'm not a true body guy, but I'm going to say it lays in limbo for a month or so. And to this day, you still see the high quality paint jobs done like the old school jobs where the code would sit in primer for a couple of months before they blocked it to let it totally shrink. Now, and we all know the older stuff shrunk in leaps and bounds compared to the newer stuff, but I still think it shrinks. So what I did was I got the sand and scratch out. <laughs> it's what I did. Um, I don't know after when this thing's in high build how long it's going to be before I sand it. I don't know. It could be a day, a week, a month, a year, ten years. I really don't know. Um, I just know that when it's in the high build and it has that crust across and you don't sand it yet, uh, it's pretty much sealed. I wouldn't say leave it out in the rain, but it's sealed. You don't have to worry about it. Um, so, um, yeah, I caught that with the bright sunlight on it. I just stopped and said, ah, let me take a look at this. And I was like, ooh, there's a sand and scratch there. And why don't I look over here? Because anybody that hangs out with me at night at cruise night knows I sit in front of the cars, whether it's my car or my friend's cars. It doesn't matter. We sit right in front of the car. And I'm always staring across the nose. And if there's a big floor there, which there still might be, if there's a big floor there, I'm going to see it every time Junior comes up with this car. So, uh, like I said, I'm going to try my best. There's going to be waves in the car and stuff. But I'm going to try my best to make it, you know, as nice as possible. Um, under the circumstances, of course. Um, so, tomorrow i got two things on my agenda that I'd like to do. One, I'd like to finish sanding the roof, which I'm right at the ed edge of being done with. Um, I still don't think the gutters are 100% yet. I have to put something on them to see them. Um, I'd like to finish sanding the um, roof, and I'd like to make this side of the car look like this side of the car. Masked off and the jam's ready to go. And then that'll just leave me the hatch and the sail panel, which as you know, Junior Strip up. 98% of the paint So the hatch has to come off the car. That means the hinges have to be unbolted from the body as well as the hatch uh, A little bit of a pain in the ass off the body because you don't want to damage the headliner um, But I was asked From uh, Chris Liberty. Sorry. I never answered probably weeks ago now if it had what type of headliner it had if it had bows or whatever to me, I think I guess it's a big piece of cardboard, and then it's covered with the uh, the material with the padding behind it. You know, like eighth inch thick. Um, I knew the headliner was fresh when I got the car. They changed it, so uh, it has a cherry headliner in there, and I don't want to ruin it. Um, what else? Uh, and Ru this is to Ruben. Ruben, I got a couple of your texts today. I was running around today. Not that it was a busy day, but it seemed like every time I got the text, I was doing something. Um, uh, Ruben had texted that he feels the distributor is very close to the firewall. And if I'm not mistaken, I mean, those cars, they came out with that firewall long before they came out with HEI. So even though that car would have came with an HEI, I think they sat close to begin with. HEI is a pretty big... Um, 
Steve tried to get one in his Nova and it didn't clear that intake manifold because that intake manifold was pre HEI. So, um, but uh, as long as it's not touching, you're good to go. The motor's only going to go left to right. If it goes front to back, we got other problems. Uh, that's basically it in a nutshell. As long as your transmission mount is still in one piece and hasn't torn and the motor got pushed back somehow, you know what I mean? So as long as it's not ripped and torn and it's still sitting where it's supposed to be, the motor's or the engine the tranny's supposed to be where it is. Um, like I said, my my theory is as long as it's not touching, we're good to go. And if there's anything to do with throttle linkage or shift the linkage, I want plenty of clearance. Everything else, if it touches, it's just a, it's just a limiter. <laughs> but I have seen people um, where the HEI cap was very very close to the firewall, and there was a lot of frame twisting on the car, and it would make the cap whack the firewall and snap. It would break the cap. So, but I don't think you're going to be uh, landing into that category. Um, I think you should be fine. So, um, I guess someday I'll get up there and I'll take a peek. I'm trying. So, uh, might be near, but not quite there in a week or so. So, we'll see. Uh,. With that said, nothing else is really going to happen. Uh, it's well after 8 o'clock now. And, uh, we're just lingering. As you can tell, it's the end of the week. I'm tired. Just taking a break. I think I'm tired from doing nothing. So, I think that, that makes your energy level drop. But, uh, with that said, did do a cruise night last night. Hung out with Mike and Steve. Uh, we did the one in Oakdale, not Oakdale, uh, Kings Park. Um, it was nice, it was packed, it was packed, different crowd, um, more uh, 50s, into 60s cars, but more in the 50s zone, uh, more um, laid back, elderly type people, and uh, 7.30 comes, it's like a bell goes off, and it's like the blue plate special is served, and it's like, and half the crowd is gone. They're like fighting each other. A lot like a ball game ended to get out of the parking lot. Uh, as opposed to some of the other shows we go to where the cars continue to come in all night long. But they usually radical muscle cars. So, but you gotta, you gotta mix it up. You can't go the same ones. There's so many to go to this year. Uh, so many. There's multiple ones per night now. And some of these things are big. So we're gonna try and get our way around. I forgot my camera. I left my camera at work, so, uh, um, which will, the, uh, engine that Steve put in that Nova wagon, slid a wrist pin, went into the cylinder wall, damaged the cylinder wall, number six, uh, that's it, done, he had to head off the other day, uh, and that motor was freshly bored, so, uh, he's gonna pop the motor and pop the piston and see if, um, the interference angle was wrong between the rod and the piston pin meaning there wasn't enough uh, retention or pressed fit between the small end of the rod to hold the pin or to see if the top of the rod actually split when it was pressed on let's find out what the deal is see if the uh, see if it's the rod see if the pin was machined too wrong uh, too small so it was something but um, he was just saying he's probably just gonna go with a great motor at this point um, but that's it. You know, not throw the engine out. The engine's definitely saveable. You just leave the one cylinder. The engine has, a, I think he was saying, 300 miles on it now. So, that was a complete rebuild. I think Mike said, because that was Mike's engine, I think he said it, the block, the lower end, was a 4 bolt main out of a 69 Camaro or something. Something to that effect. Um,. So, it's definitely not something you throw in a dumpster. So, with that said, guys, I'm not going to do any more today. Well, not that I really did anything. and uh, But I will be back out here tomorrow. I'm going to try, like I said, work on that roof. And I want to get the sedan up and moving. Um, battery shot, finally. Yay. 
I put that battery in in 2001. We were going for the grand record. And I guarantee if I charge it, I could probably get another season out of it. But to me, when a, when a battery shows that it's dying, this is a key. This is something that a lot of people ignore. But when your battery starts to show age, it's time to change it. Because think of it this way. I'll say quick so I'm running out of, out of tape. If it takes 150 amps to start the car, your battery's rated for 600 amps and it's only able to put out 250 amps because it's old and tired. That means every time that car fires, you'll never notice nothing, but your alternator goes into full load to try and get that battery back and continues to just keep going and going and going and going. So in the long run, you got a choice. Alternators on today's cars are four or five hundred dollars, right? I mean, I'm not talking about the, the shitty twenty dollar one rebuilt ones that last a week. I'm talking a real alternator, or you could just buy a hundred dollar battery when it's due and save your alternator, and your alternator lasts the life of the car. So, something to think about. Okay, guys, uh, with that, I think I'm too tired to get out of the chair. Okay, guys. Um, we'll be making some videos tomorrow or something. Hopefully you see me washing the sedan. First time water will touch that car in 17 years if I wash it. And it has to be washed. 17 years it hasn't touched water.